The year is 2156. Humanity has been wiped off the face of the Earth. One creature remains in place. A creature fought over by the scientific and enthusiast communities for centuries. A creature resurrected from broken dreams, shattered childhoods, scientific ambition, and the quest for truth. If only we know the cost. Spinosaurus now reigns supreme. Animations in this video were made by Chris Masna and Julian Johnson Mortimer. Chris Masna is a wonderful artist who's worked on things like Saurian, Pokemon, and more. Julian Johnson Mortimer is an animator who's worked on such documentaries as Monsters Resurrected and David Attenborough's Natural History Museum Alive. Spinosaurus has popped up once again. Well, I don't know what I expected. Yeah, as fragmentary as the critter is right now, lots and lots can still be debated. Or perhaps that's because it's fragmentary. I continue to grow weary of the Spinosaurus discussion, just as I have with anything regarding Tyrannosaurus, but since everyone loves these titans of pop culture and science, I feel like I have to at least try to talk about them. The latest in Spinosaurus research is brought to us by the lovely fellas Dr. Dave Hone, a Tyrannosaur and Pterosaur researcher, and Dr. Thomas Holtz, a Theropod dinosaur researcher. They've published a paper that expands upon a paper they published in 2017 on the ecology of the Spinosaurus as a group, as well as reviewing and revising the group as it stood at the time. Therefore, this new paper goes into excruciating detail to provide as many references, sources, comparisons, measurements, just straight up data about the genus Spinosaurus. This was to open up a dialogue about the strength of the ecological hypothesis proposed for the spined reptile in 2014 and 2020 by Dr. Nizar Ibrahim and team. This new paper provided free and open access through the Journal of Paleontologica Electronica is titled simply The Ecology of Spinosaurus. I recommend perusing the paper as I couldn't possibly cover every aspect of it in this video. With that said, I'll do my best to provide a good summary of the new research. This paper tackles a bunch of interrelated hypotheses that have been proposed for Spinosaurus since it was first found. The most recent hypothesis suggests that Spinosaurus is extremely unique among theropods, and even among the Spinosauridae. A derived, highly aquatic pursuit predator that accelerated after giant, car-sized fish with its paddle-like tail. All of the Spinosaurids, like Baryonyx and Suchomimus, are widely regarded as being at least partially piscivorous, or fish-eating. They are also considered to have potential affinities for aquatic habitats as a result. Many of them are found in rock deposits that represent areas in or near these kinds of habitats, and the fossilized gut contents of some confirm they ate fish from time to time. Whether that was their main diet or just a part remains unknown. It does not exclude the group from predating on other prey items, and some spinosaurs, like Baryonyx, have preserved remains of dinosaurs in their bellies as well. The recent discovery of the most complete spinosaur skeleton to date, published in 2014, and the collection of the tail, published in 2020, has provided a never-before-seen window into the biology and ecology of the latest spinosaurs. With the new discoveries of Spinosaurus material came new hypotheses about how the animal lived. The most prevalent of these ideas, based on the new finds, is, as I laid out earlier, an aquatic specialist which actively sought out huge prey items like a marine mammal. This seemed like an obvious conclusion to reach given the overall characteristics preserved with the new skeleton. 
long snout, nose and eye holes placed at the top of the skull, dense bones, splayed, fish-eating teeth, short limbs, and paddle-shaped tail. This idea clearly stands in stark contrast to all previous hypotheses and suggests an ecology unique among all non-avian dinosaurs, even the group to which Spinosaurus belongs. This then led to the construction of two different ecological models for Spinosaurus. These two models are not mutually exclusive and both share some aspects. Doctors Hone and Holtz have dubbed the two models the Waiting Model and the Pursuit Predator Model. They represent a more aquatic lifestyle versus a more terrestrial one. Pursuit Predator Model This model says that Spinosaurus was an active, specialized aquatic predator that pursued and caught prey within the water column. This is the model supported by the work of Dr. Nizar Ibrahim and colleagues. As Hone and Holtz point out, there is no universally agreed upon definition of pursuit predator in the literature. The term has variously been applied to marine reptiles like ichthyosaurs, birds like the peregrine falcon, and land predators like the cheetah or hyena. It has been applied to these groups to define a fast animal that pursues agile prey over a given distance. Evidence given to support this model for Spinosaurus is as follows. Pachyostotic skeleton. Pachyostosis is the condition by which bones of part or all of the skeleton is thickened. This goes hand in hand with an increase in bone density. This occurs in animals with an aquatic lifestyle as it provides ballast. Interlocking teeth. Teeth that are tightly organized to slide past one another. These are used mostly by aquatic animals to catch slippery prey, but is also seen in aerial predators that need to catch fast-moving prey like insects. Snout Sensory System The holes pockmarking the snout of Spinosaurus, called foramina, are hypothesized to provide a sensory capability, like in crocodiles. Swim Adapted Tail the new tail would have provided a large surface area perfect for propelling the animal through the water. Dorsally positioned eyes and nose. The eye sockets and nose holes are placed high up on the skull. This is usually seen in animals that keep most of their bodies submerged in water for long periods of time. Hippos, crocodilians, and many amphibians utilize this adaptation. Reduced hind limbs. Many aquatic animals have reduced hind limbs so that their limbs are relatively similar in length. This condition changes depending on the main force of propulsion used by the animal. The extinct Hesperornithids, for example, had huge hind limbs for swimming. Enlarged and possibly webbed toes. Spinosaurus is notable for having large, fat toes, which are usually seen in animals that need to stay above a soft substrate or in animals that have webbing in between the toes for the same reason. Flat Claws The claws of Spinosaurus appear to be quite wide and flat, which would have helped increase surface area of the foot. These characteristics add up to a Spinosaurus that is semi-aquatic with a proposed lifestyle akin to crocodilians. This model therefore proposes Spinosaurus was highly adapted for life in the water, with a reduced capacity for terrestrial life. Waiting Model The waiting model is one which has existed before the Hone and Holtz paper, but is the one which the two have found the most evidence to support. The waiting model considers Spinosaurids as animals that mostly stuck around the banks of rivers and lakes, the margins of aquatic environments. In combination with these habitats, these dinosaurs would be generalist carnivores that foraged for fish and other aquatic prey items from the shorelines. They could also take prey from land and use their forearms for foraging buried items. There's already a bunch of evidence that Spinosaurids were more specialized for capturing slippery, water-dwelling prey such as fish, so this isn't a surprise, but neither is it unique to Spinosaurus. Wherever you find Spinosaurid specimens, you find a lot of them, but they are generally rare throughout the area. 
This points to a general exploitation of resources that other theropods couldn't do throughout the group's evolutionary history. This also suggests these dinosaurs often moved or migrated between patchy resources. The weighting model for Spinosaurus finds that the animal wasn't adapted for an aquatic existence, but depending on the definition, it could still be considered semi-aquatic. The weighting model proposes these animals acted more like giant herons or storks. They took their fish and aquatic prey from the edges of water, like banks and beaches, or after taking a short stroll into shallow water. They could then waddle their way onto land to snap at land prey whenever they got bored of fish fingers. This model doesn't, however, dispel the hypothesis that Spinosaurus could or did swim. The tail alone suggests it was used for some kind of propulsion. No living terrestrial animals survive on fish alone, and the ability to swim would provide Spinosaurus, and Spinosaurids in general, the ability to get from one patch of resources to another. While the first Pursuit Predator model is focused almost squarely on the shoulders of the Spinosaurus genus, and of course could relate to other very close relatives, the weighting model better applies generally to all Spinosaurids, or members of the Spinosauridae. The unique specializations between genera of Spinosaurids and between the families Spinosaurinae and Baryonicinae are considered by Hone and Holtz to be comparable to the difference between living crocodilians. The crocodiles, alligators, caiman, and gharials. These animals all share a good suite of characteristics, but differ most strongly in the head and what they use that head for. Hone and Holtz also made note on the taxonomy of Spinosaurus as it relates to its ecology. Taxonomy is the study of how an animal goes from death to fossil. Though Spinosaurus is the best known of the derived Spinosaurians, its taxonomy remains controversial. Uncertainties over the exact identities of the various elements of Spinosaurus found over the last hundred or so years remain intact. I've talked about this a bit more in depth in my first Spinosaurus video over the tail discovery. In short, the original fossil was destroyed in World War II, and various Spinosaurus-like fossil fragments have been found since, from Egypt to Morocco. Not every single specimen overlaps enough with one another for everyone to agree they all belonged to the Spinosaurus genus, or the species within it. The specimen described in 2014 comes from Morocco and does have a lot in common with the photographs of the first specimens found in the 1900s but not perfectly. The most recent paper to tackle the mismatching parts of all the Spinosaurus specimens was the 2020 paper by Dr. Nizar Ibrahim and company. This was also the paper describing the new tail elements. Ibrahim and team's conclusion was to lump every specimen labeled Spinosaurus and the extremely fragmentary remains of Sigil Massasaurus into the species Spinosaurus aegyptiacus. The new paper by Hone and Holtz does not agree with what Ibrahim and team did, but they write their paper under the assumption that all specimens belong to Spinosaurus aegyptiacus, because their findings would be correct regardless of the true diversity of the Spinosaurians. The new paper provides a figure of the speculative skeleton of Spinosaurus, with an illustration of their conclusions. I'm going to go through this diagram as it gets their point across quite well. But before I do that, I have to talk about their methods. In order to reach these conclusions, the researchers took on multiple lines of evidence that took living semi-aquatic animals from many different groups into account, on top of fossil evidence. They assessed the shape of Spinosaurus's skull to figure out what it was used for by compiling a dataset of skull length, width, and height for various critters, including all of the Spinosaurids, a bunch of unrelated theropods, more closely related ones like the Megalosaurs, and living animals like crocs, croc-like reptiles like Champsosaurs and Phytosaurs, marine reptiles, and monitor lizards. This was to compare both terrestrial, aquatic, and semi-aquatic animals that are both related and unrelated to the Spinosaurs, as well as comparing all of the Spinosaurs. They compared skull length to height to width to length from nostrils to snout tip to length from nostrils to skull top to
to length from eye sockets to skull top, as well as skull width versus height. They used some stupid math thing called a principal components analysis I won't bother delving into to analyze all of the data comparisons. Then they took a closer statistical look at the ungules, or toe claws, of Spinosaurus, so they could relevantly compare them to the toe claws of other animals. The shape and size of the toe claws can help to add a piece of the puzzle of what that animal did when it was alive. The bony toe claws can also be used to approximate a relatively accurate size of the keratin sheath that covered it in life, which would have obscured the true size and shape of the claw. They decided on using a geometric analysis since it would provide a generally accurate idea of what the claws were good at doing. To do this, they needed to get the angle of the bottom of the claw. To get this, they measured the length from base of the claw to its tip from the side. They placed a perpendicular line in between this measurement until it contacted the claw. Triangles were made, and bada bing bada boom, you've got a generally correct angle. To get anything statistically significant, they plotted the claw's angle against the whole length of the ungule, and then did this over and over again with the same number of taxa they did for the skull measurements. Okay, so now that we got the math down, we can take a more in-depth look at this diagram and go over everything that supports the Hone and Holtz model, or the Ibrahim model. The color of these arrows corresponds to the level at which the part of the body they point to supports either of the two models. A black arrow actively contradicts the model. A gray one is ambiguous or doesn't really contradict or support the model and the white one directly supports the model. Let's go through them one by one. A refers to the shape of the skull. The skull of Spinosaurus is what's called laterally compressed. It's thin from side to side. This condition is quite common in theropods, but quite rare in semi-aquatic to aquatic animals. Instead, these animals usually have what's called a dorsoventrally compressed skull which just means it's thin from top to bottom and wide from side to side. A laterally compressed skull, like what you see in Spinosaurus, is great for striking up and down, and the dorsal ventrally compressed skull, like what you see in Crocs, is great for striking side to side. This therefore actively contradicts the pursuit model and directly supports the waiting model. B refers to the position of the nostril openings, referred to as nares on the skull. The nares of Spinosaurus are retracted what's called posteriorly, or closer to the back of the skull, rather than the front, which would be anteriorly. Though they are pulled back pretty far from the tip of the snout, they aren't raised up near the top of the skull, which is a condition present in semi-aquatic animals. This position is great for dipping the snout below the waterline, but does not work for an animal that would only have its skull above the water. Therefore, it actively contradicts the pursuit model and directly supports the waiting model. C refers to mechanical jaw performance, how the jaws were physically used by the animal to capture prey. Previous studies have been done on the much more complete baryonics as to the mechanical performance of the jaws. These studies found that the jaws of baryonics were probably used more like the jaws of the gharial, not like the alligator. This study also hypothesized that baryonics may have taken small fish as a major part of its diet, similar to the gharial. A later study in 2013 then compared the skulls of Baryonyx and Spinosaurus and found them to be broadly similar to one another in shape and use. The big difference, of course, is that Spinosaurus had a larger head with more robust teeth, telling you it just ate larger things. This means Spinosaurus had jaws adapted more for short, fast bursts and vertical lunges rather than pursuit predation. Therefore, it actively contradicts the pursuit model and directly supports the waiting model. D refers to the position of the eye sockets, called orbits. The orbits of Spinosaurus are not raised up to help the animal see above their waterline. 
This adaptation can be observed in crocodiles, hippos, and many semi-aquatic lizards. The eye sockets of Spinosaurus are actually quite similar to those of other theropods, including other Spinosaurids that were never even hypothesized to be pursuit predators in the first place. Therefore, it actively contradicts the pursuit model and directly supports the waiting model. E refers to the top or dorsal part of the neck. The neck of Spinosaurus is stiff and long. This matches the necks of animals like herons, implying a strong support would be needed for the neck and head. This is something you don't find in semi or fully aquatic animals. It's ambiguous evidence for the pursuit model, it doesn't prove or disprove it, but it directly supports the waiting model. F refers to the overall shape of the animal and its hydrodynamics. The shape of the sail and body of Spinosaurus is not hydrodynamic and would add a significant amount of drag to the animal if it tried swimming fast enough to be a pursuit predator. This has always been a point of contention for Spinosaurus being a semi-aquatic leviathan, but I never gave it much thought due to the other parts of Spinosaurus that seemed to scream semi-aquatic. It neither contradicts nor supports the waiting model, but actively contradicts the pursuit model. G refers to the stability of the sail. Dr. Donald Henderson of the Royal Tyrell Museum published a paper in 2018 which took umbrage with the semi-aquatic hypothesis for Spinosaurus, proposed by Ibrahim four years prior. This paper tested the buoyancy of Spinosaurus against other dinosaurs via a digital buoyancy model test. He found that Spinosaurus' sail would have made the animal unstable when fully or partially submerged. He also found the animal was too buoyant to be good at being a semi-aquatic animal which needs to be able to sink quickly. Henderson's digital models didn't take into account how wide and barrel-shaped the rib cage of Spinosaurus was, as you can see here with the rather svelte trunk. This does not contradict the instability of the sail, but just the buoyancy of the animal as a whole. An unstable body isn't something that would help an active pursuit predator. Therefore, it actively contradicts the pursuit model and is ambiguous for the waiting model. H refers to the way in which Spinosaurus would have moved based on the body and tail shape. The tail would have been shaped like an eel in life and would have swished from side to side in moderately tight arcs. This type of locomotion is called subanguliform because it is like that of an eel. It's known it moved its tail like this because the tail vertebrae lack strong forward and backward patches of bone, which are called pre- and post zygopophyses. The smaller these are, the tighter the bones could swing from side to side. This type of propulsion is seen in inefficient swimmers and not active pursuit predators. It therefore actively contradicts the pursuit model and neither contradicts nor supports the waiting model. I refers to the very ends of the tail vertebrae. The very tips of these spines, called neural spines, will show you how much muscle would attach to them when the animal was alive. The more rugose or rough the texture of this part of the bone is, the more muscle was attached. The tips of these tail spines are quite smooth, suggesting little muscle and not a very strong tail, nor a thickening into any sort of fin. This actively contradicts the pursuit model, but is ambiguous for the waiting model. J refers to how tail length affects propulsion. Propulsion from long tails is great for short bursts of speed. They aren't good for sustained power in pursuit. This does directly support the pursuit model, but is ambiguous for the waiting model, meaning it fits both. K refers to the way the tail is constructed. Pursuit predators have tails that are stiffened at their ends. This is the opposite for Spinosaurus, which had a tail with a thickly muscled base, with the last two-thirds extremely flexible. This results in the eel-like side-to-side I discussed earlier, and means it couldn't be a fast swimmer. This actively contradicts the pursuit model, and is ambiguous for the waiting model. L refers to swimming efficiency. I talked about this in my Spinosaurus 2020 video as a main piece of evidence pointing towards use of the tail for swimming. 
However, there's more to the story. The tail paper tested the swimming efficiencies of various animal tail shapes compared to Spinosaurus. They found that crocodiles were the most efficient, and that Spinosaurus had an efficiency higher than other known terrestrial theropod dinosaurs, but far less efficient than crocodilians. In fact, the crocodilian tail was one and a half times more efficient. Yet these animals are not pursuit predators. They are slow swimmers that can put on a burst of speed to nab anything nearby. A low efficiency tail like Spinosaurus's does not support a pursuit model and doesn't contradict the waiting model. M refers to the legs. The legs of Spinosaurus have been a sore subject. The legs had been completely unknown for Spinosaurus until that 2014 publication of the Morocco skeleton. To everyone's surprise, it showed Spinosaurus as one of them chuds that skips leg day. As small as they seem, Hone and Holtz found they weren't nearly as small when compared to most living and extinct semi-aquatic animals like crocodiles. Animals that evolved to be more and more aquatic reduced their limbs altogether to produce a body shape that approaches a giant fin. This makes swimming easier. Mosasaurs and Metriorhynchids, the marine crocs, all show this condition. There are exceptions, of course. The limbs, therefore, neither support nor contradict either models, as these limbs would allow the animal to wade and wouldn't exactly stop it from being a pursuit predator. N refers to the enlarged first toe. The first toe in theropods is usually that little dangly one higher up on the foot. It's informally called a dewclaw, and in birds it became the hallux. Spinosaurus had an unusually large one that was more in line with the rest of the foot's toes. This toe was weight-bearing and would have made their feet have four full toes. The enlarged first toe would have helped support the weight of the animal, help it to swim, and use the feet for control as it moved through the water. On top of that, the possibility that the toes were webbed would have allowed the animal to wade and walk on soft sediment like mud or silt. This characteristic would fit with either model. O oh. refers to the density of the skeleton. Most semi and fully aquatic animals have dense bones. These animals need to sink easily, so they only need to use their muscles to rise. If something had super airy, light bones, it would be more likely to float, and sinking would be an arduous task on top of trying to rise. One of the main pieces of evidence used for the pursuit model was that the bones of Spinosaurus are denser than other dinosaurs and roughly equivalent to what you see in semi-aquatic tetrapods. The skeleton of Spinosaurus does show a thickening of bones called pachyostosis. This places this anatomical characteristic squarely in the directly support category for the pursuit model. However, Hone and Holtz found that the overall buoyancy of the animal was still positive, this means that, despite its heavier bones, it would still float by default. This makes it an issue for diving, and an issue for the pursuit model, unless it can be overruled. As it stands, the pachyostosis of the skeleton neither contradicts nor supports the waiting model. P denotes how the skeleton of Spinosaurus, though generally denser than other theropods, still retains some pneumaticity that is more common in terrestrial dinosaurs. This level of holiness is not negligible and adds onto the positive buoyancy calculations mentioned earlier. Diving would be strenuous. This characteristic neither supports nor contradicts either model, since it wouldn't totally exclude the animal from going through with strenuous activity to reach deep water food sources, nor would it exclude a wading animal from trying to get into deeper water. Q labels the forelimbs. The forelimbs of Spinosaurus are rather large, despite them being one of the more fragmentary parts of the skeleton known. What remains that do exist suggest a size not overly unique among the other Spinosaurids. They are not reduced, and reduced forelimbs are something you see in semi-aquatic animals like crocs. The forelimb size then contradicts the pursuit model and not the waiting model. R is for the lower neck muscles. 
The arrangement of the bones in this area suggests a neck musculature that could flex the neck strongly downwards, a movement called ventriflexion. This combines with the strong muscle attachment sites on the top of the neck for a strong neck in up and down motions. These under neck meets strongly contradict the pursuit model and supports the waiting model. S labels the quadrates. The quadrates are these pieces of bones that connect to the lower jaw in reptiles. The shape of Spinosaurus's quadrates would allow the animal to swallow enormous food items. This characteristic fits either model. T refers to the head posture. Hone and Holtz figured the head posture of Spinosaurus based on similarities with the South American Irritator, which had a more rigorous analysis of its inner ear bones to determine neutral posture. Spinosaurus held its head angled downwards. This goes pretty well with the positions of the eyes and nostrils for something that dips its snout into the water from a wading position. If we look at this figure from the Hone and Holtz paper, we can see that a pursuit model wouldn't have enough of its eyes or nose above the water surface to create a good vantage point, as per the crocodile. As such, this actively contradicts the pursuit model and strongly supports the waiting model. U refers to the isotopic data for Spinosaurus. When an animal's body produces bone and teeth, the body takes in minerals and elements from the environment and the food it eats. A lot of that stuff it takes in gets incorporated into the bone or tooth. Oxygen is just one of the handful of materials that ends up in these tissues. In the case of bone, oxygen is incorporated into hydroxyapatite, which is the main mineral bone is made of. Every element loses some neutrons over time as radiation. You can get a precise date for a bone by measuring the number of radioactive isotopes left in the object. This method is most accurate with the element carbon for recently dead organisms. Oxygen, on the other hand, is a good marker of the ecology of the organism because they take in oxygen through ingestion. Teeth are the best parts of the skeleton to get accurate readings of oxygen isotopes because the tissues that make up the tooth remain the way they were when the tooth first formed, until the tooth is lost from the mouth or the animal dies. This means that whatever oxygen isotopes are measured from a tooth, no matter how old that tooth is, they represent the oxygen present in the environment when that tooth was formed. From there, you can work out what environment that was by comparing the tooth's oxygen levels to various modern environments that match it. For Spinosaurus, the isotopic analysis of its teeth concludes different things. A good number of the teeth have isotopic signatures suggesting they spent a considerable amount of time in the water, while other specimens suggest the opposite. An alternation between aquatic and terrestrial environments is what this proves. Though this kind of behavior is common in some crocodile populations, one of the most often compared living animals, the combination of isotopes and all the other features don't make the purely aquatic model look promising. As such, the isotopes actively contradict the pursuit model and directly support the waiting model. V labels the teeth decorations. The teeth of Spinosaurus lack strong serrations. Instead, the teeth are decorated in vertical fluting ridges, from the base to the tip, all the way around. These ridges are often seen on the teeth of aquatic predators, which seems to support the pursuit model. However, this tooth type correlates more with what the predator is eating than the lifestyle. A predator doesn't have to be aquatic itself to eat aquatic prey. As it currently stands, it provides support for the pursuit model, but neither supports nor contradicts the waiting model. Further study of the microscopic wear and tear on the teeth enamel would be needed to get some more deets on this particular aspect of the spined reptile. W designates all the holes pockmarking the face of Spinosaurus. These holes are seen in most tetrapod animals, in varying number and placement. The crocodilians have some of the largest numbers of these holes, while mammals tend to have the fewest. These holes are called foramina. They are openings in bone to allow tubes to carry nutrients, like blood, from one part of the animal to another. 
Crocodile skulls have thousands of these holes, which act as a sensory network across the skull, since they are openings for nerves. This has been a prevalent hypothesis for the hole's purpose in Spinosaurus. If this is a sensory system, then it would benefit either model. Phew! Yeah, wow, that's a lot of stuff to go through. Hope you've stayed with me all this time. Make sure you click the like button, subscribe to the channel, and ring the notification bell to keep up to date with Edge content. Here's the tally of data that supports the waiting model, supports the pursuit model, and is ambiguous either way. Most of the front half of the animal supports a waiting model, while some of the characteristics from the underside of the dinosaur supports the pursuit model. A lot of characteristics that contradict the pursuit model are ambiguous for the waiting model, since they really don't preclude or exclude a waiting existence. Overall, I think Hone and Holtz did a wonderful job working through the miasma of Spinosaurus research to come up with a thorough walkthrough of everything Spinosaurus. This paper isn't meant to prove one thing over another. Rather, it's meant to provide all of the data and to see what works with which model. As it turned out, more works with a waiting model than it does with the pursuit model. Does that mean the pursuit or swimming model is wrong, inaccurate, or impossible? No, of course not. This all just proves that the waiting model is the more likely one. For the swimming model to hold water, much more complete skeletons of verifiable spinosauruses need to be found to add to the data pile. Those specimens would need to provide a lot of hard evidence to overturn the waiting model, which, at this time, has more going for it. Semi-aquatic Spinosaurus lives, but the data is weak for it, while the older, waiting heron model remains the strongest contender for the life of the Spinosaurus. Rumors abound of more Spinosaurus material out there being recovered right now. New work is coming on many different Spinosaurs to help clarify things. It's reasonable to characterize Drs. Dave Hone and Thomas Holtz's paper as the most robust and in-depth assessment of the ecology and behavior of both Spinosaurus and the Spinosauridae to date. It helps to redress the balance of Spinosaurus hypotheses, which have been advocated over the years, with what turns out to be very little and quite weak evidence. This paper also gives a much harder foundation to work from, to suss out which Spinosaurs were doing what and how. This is a major step forward in the understanding of these unusual and enigmatic animals. Other paleontologists have teased that more papers on Spinosaurus are forthcoming, and neither the paleo community nor I can wait to see what is found. Further research could easily overturn the waiting heron model and prove the pursuit model correct. A new model that differs from either of the previous two could also be put forth. Such is the way of science, but especially Spinosaur science. Things are not over. Things are not settled. And likely won't be for a long while. This may have been why the swimming Spinosaurus became such a huge, well-loved paleoart meme. It was thought that the science of Spinosaurus was finally settled, and that the critter was definitely an aquatic fish eater only. Even I got caught up in it a little bit. To drift away from the idea that the science of Spinosaurus is settled, Dr. Hone provided a list of possible avenues for future research to help refine the idea of Spinosaurus. Let's look through that list and see if anything inspires you. What does Neris and orbit position look like in an even wider range of reptiles and in birds? What is the overall density and distribution of mass? In particular, how buoyant would it be? What was the exact arrangement of the neck muscles? How flexible is the neck? How stiff is the dorsal series? What is the exact arrangement of the dorsal sail? How much drag would the sail or legs produce when swimming? How much wave drag would there be at different depths? How spread were the toes? Is this more than other theropods? What swimming form would it use, whole body or just the tail? Would leg thrusts help in propulsion or add more drag than thrust? How flexible is the tail? How strong are the caudal neural spines? How much muscle did it really have in the tail, and where? Would increased flexibility help it provide propulsion? 
Would a leg and tail driven thrust in water be effective even for a single thrust? How efficient would it be walking? What would the efficiency calculations for the tail look like with a more accurate model with variable flexibility and different degrees of submergence? Are there more general common features of various aquatic and semi-aquatic reptile lineages? And can we quantify things like leg reduction, tail musculature, drag reduction, etc. to look at this as more of a continuum than a binary state? Is ungual curvature driven in part by size, evolutionary relationships, habitats? What are the isotopic signatures like for the teeth that are in situ in jaws? How many different habitats and environments did Spinosaurus truly occupy, and what were these like? These research hypotheses show that the work on Spinosaurus can be pushed forward with strength and vigor. Though the paper covers all kinds of different bits of anatomy, ecology, mechanics, possible behaviors, and with considerations to the environments, it's still just starting points. It's all based on existing fossils, and any future discoveries like an arm or a skull is only going to provide more delicious data and fuel to the fires of backseat driving paleo enthusiast dweebs on Twitter. Hopefully these are all ideas people can tackle. Take home message. From the mind and keyboard of Dr. Dave Hone himself. I'm not saying Spinosaurus didn't or couldn't swim, or that it couldn't swim better than most other th large theropods. But evidence presented to date that it was a semi-aquatic animal and a specialist hunter in water, specifically a pursuit predator, is not really well supported from the currently available evidence. It may even ultimately turn out to be correct, but as things stand, the evidence is weak, and there are a lot of gaps and contradictions to this model. The purported arguments that Spinosaurus was some croc-like or even stem whale-like animal spending the vast majority of its time in water and the way that it's been illustrated swimming in deep water, even diving and pursuing fish, does not hold up to scrutiny. Instead, a wading model of a more heron or stork-like animal that spent a lot of its time in and around water, but fundamentally fished while standing rather than swimming, is supported. So, that's the long and short of it. Come back next week and there'll probably be something new for everyone to collectively shit their pants over. Make sure you like this video and share it around. Leave a comment if you like and subscribe. Hit the bell icon too if you want to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching. Pledge to my Patreon at any tier you like for a slew of many delicious offerings. Special thanks to patrons Dinosaur, Natty Cat, Steve Bradshaw, Thais Fenson, Arda Bayer, Ray M, Dana Manchester, Aphid Kirby, and Chris Frampton. This is Jimmy from Dinosaurs Will Always Be Awesome. I did the voice of Dr. Dave Hone for today's presentation, and I will be apologizing for the accent for the rest of my life. You can find me at Dinosaurs Will Always Be Awesome at duaba.org. You can follow me on my own channel, Dinosaurs Will Always Be Awesome, or find me on Instagram at Dinosaur Podcast.